Good day and welcome back to the 40 OT podcast with your host as always, Mr. Thomas Henley. Today I have, again, another very special episode for you guys. This is going to be an episode that was very much in the makings for a long time. Basically, I, I received an email around about a year or so ago from someone who listens to the 40 OT podcast. Lovely, lovely uh, woman called uh, Liv, who I'm going to speak to today. And basically, she was talking all about sort of the, the benefits that the, the podcast had on her. She's very into podcasting. So I was like, we need to set up an episode. F- fast forward about a year, we've been trying to set it up. We're both very, very busy. And we've both been finding it very hard to find time to, to set the episode up. But it is finally the time. So... I just want to make a little bit of a nod to the date of recording. We are recording on the 14th of February, which is Valentine's Day. And I just wanted to put this out there that, you know, Valentine's Day, although it can be great for some people, can be very, very hard for other people. And, you know, I I find it really weird that we have a specific day for this kind of thing. Me and my my partner actually had our Valentine's Day like um, on the weekend, so we avoided all the busy times, avoided all the, you know, the expensive prices and stuff. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, I think I think it's important to to realize that you know you don't, although there are these social norms and social expectations to, you know, have a partner and you know put it on social media and go, oh look what my partner did to me and. <laughs> You know, I I find it very, uh, very, very silly. I feel like it should be a very private affair. And I don't don't really think it should be confined to just romantic relationships. You know, you can show love to everybody. But that's 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 a little bit of a of a a mention, a bit of a nod to Valentine's Day. Getting back on track, we're going to be talking today about autism and eating disorders Um, as Many of you may know from watching previous episodes, I have had a rocky road with with eating disorders, being bulimic when I was younger, and also now struggling struggling with binge eating disorder, which has sort of been an ongoing thing. And so there's going to be a bit of a, a, a warning label. You know, if if you find that discussions around eating disorders is going to upset you, perhaps stuff around mental health. Uh, this is probably not the episode for you, but if you feel like it's something that you want to listen to, very happy to have you with us. So without further ado, how are you doing today, Liv? Well, I am so, so excited to be here and I, I loved your intro. And when you said about a year ago, I feel like it's been long. <laughs> yeah, it probably <laughs> because, has. Yeah. Because you were on the Live Label Free podcast and mm. I am positive that episode was more than a year ago (laughs) so yeah I think suffice to say we've been trying to set this up forever and I'm just so so excited to be here today to talk about a very very important topic and I am of course honored to do it on Valentine's Day even though (laughs) I agree that I think all these days right autism awareness day Valentine's Day Thanksgiving right like why don't we just make these things a forever thing i i think you know like first of all like autism awareness day i'm like we don't need more awareness we need more acceptance and just like people show their love on other days besides valentine's day i think i think it was created by the card companies as well like it's definitely like a marketing move by oh absolutely like even do do you do you feel that stress as a as a sort of like content creator to like make sure that you get like a specific episode or post out for a certain day and i i've i mean i've heard from other creators that like especially autism like awareness week and and month and stuff it's always like a really stressful time what what do you think about that yeah well for me personally it used to be like any type of holiday even my just my birthday i would be like so stressed because i'm like (laughs) oh now i have to do another post just for this and 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 when I kind of realized, like, as I started internalizing the live label free philosophy more and more, I realized, like, I, I, it is in my power to choose whether or not I allow this external circumstance to decide my actions or whether I just do things 
on my own sure. time and in my own way. I also, everyone does it, don't they? So it's, right. it's you, you know, like comes around Christmas time. There's all these these posts about like autism at Christmas, and like even though like it sounds like that would be the perfect time to get like views on a post or like followers, right? Like they never perform well. For well, me, it's like... because it's not. It's because it's not evergreen, right? It's like people are not going to listen to autism at Christmas in August, right? Yeah. Whereas, so so that's kind of for me also been like. I actually recently heard a quote that I loved, and it really helped me to like, I guess, put the final step in. Like, I'm going to stop making content specifically for these special days and holidays, and that was the opposite of courage in society is not cowardice it's conformity and mm, i loved mm. that so so much um because it's so true like in society we always think we have to be doing what everyone else is doing to fit in and to be and you know to, to be successful but the thing is that the most successful people the, the most people that live in freedom and don't feel so much pressure or stress are the people that do something completely different yeah, because the individuals like, yeah exactly and yeah, also with with my cookbook, which is now finally out by the time this yes. episode airs. Tell, tell us, uh, tell us about it, because I'm going to be sticking that in the Yay. in the description. Because I know you've been hard at work on it. Yes, well, um, it's called Nourishing Neurodiversity, and it's filled with over 50 simple recipes to nourish both um the body and mind. And I've learned a lot over the years about the mind gut connection and how mm, if you have a lot crazy. of anxiety, like you're really going to suffer from digestive issues because we have so many serotonin receptors mm. and neurotransmitters in, in our gut. Like it's not for nothing. We have these expressions like, oh, to have rainbow no rainbow what am i saying to butterflies <laughs> is it because of the light in the background it's like probably maybe. because <laughs> i have a lot of association with with rainbows um like my memoir actually that's coming out in i don't know yet in a couple months is called rainbow girl my journey to living life in full <laughs> color because nice. growing up rainbow girl was my nickname because i only drew symmetrical rainbows and castles but yeah, anyways, kind of going back to the cookbook, it has been in the making for a very, very, very long time. And I was always like, okay, I want to bring it out for my birthday. I want to bring it out for Christmas. But every time something came up and there was some edit that had gone horribly wrong, and I was like, no, but now I have to set the next deadline. And then it was at one point, you're like, you know what? I'm just going to bring it out when it's done. And yeah. I don't care yeah. when this is going to be, but that day is going to be special in and of itself because I'm bringing my cookbook out on that day. So now it's officially out as of February 21st, 2023. So it's just, I think, I think I'm going to release this as the next one, but the next episode, I think that would be Tuesday. So that's like a couple of days after the pot, this you're hearing this, um, go over onto Liv's uh, links down in the comments. So I, I'll post like your link tree or something, and there'll, there'll be like sounds great. Yeah, some, some areas yeah. you can do it. But um, I I think we we probably skipped over like the the introduction a little bit. <laughs> do Do you want to tell us a little bit, sort of about the work that you do and some of like the social media stuff that you do on Instagram? Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Liv, and my I'm the brand or the face or the person behind live label free um and my whole philosophy with live label free is that i believe that any type of restriction or limitation um or fear of life of living of anything is rooted in in labels like for me personally my eating disorder like was was rooted in labels seeing food as good or bad caused me Mm. to restrict certain foods seeing rest as lazy and exercise as productive caused me to basically run myself into a dark hole of misery. Mm, mm. And and in society and diet culture, we see so many labels, gluten-free, dairy-free, vegan, this, blah, blah, good, healthy, bad, um, normal, not normal. Like it's it's overwhelming, um, especially I think for neurodivergent individuals. And I think for me also, like my literal brain really took certain health recommendations growing up really too, I took them too literally seeing like, as you should eat this and you should avoid that because if you'll, if you eat cookies, you'll get this illness and you'll do this and this will happen. 
And I got all these fears around all these external labels basically plastered onto everyone because, of course, we live in a di- in a society mm-hmm. that's infested mm-hmm. with fat phobia and diet culture. And Keto, I'm, paleo, yeah, vegan, vegetarian, pescatarian. <laughs> well, like, well yeah, obviously, like the obviously the there's, there's caveats to those ones, but yeah. and even with just like neurodivergence and, and autism, it's like, oh, you're not normal, or you're weird, or this is a problem behavior. <laughs> I'm sure, like, sure. it's so not helpful. And and for me, I I really on my own journey to freedom, not only from my eating disorder. Can you hear that in the background? Is that is that my um No no they're music. like building behind my house or something. Do you hear that? Let me turn my Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I think it'll be okay. It'll okay, be okay. Because you're like hammering or doing something. Um I don't know. Um I don't know what was I talking about. Yeah, if yeah. you if you hear something, guys, it's that you're not going crazy. Um <laughs> Yeah, they they've decided to like hammer behind my house. Yes, um yeah. but anyways. Yeah, for me, I mean, growing up, I was diagnosed with anorexia and depression as young as, as 11, and anxiety and OCD came on top of that. Um, and then when I was 15, as I was tossed in and out of the treatment system, I was labeled as manipulative and too complex and a hopeless case and told I was never going to get better. You know, all these labels just hmm. made me really not want to live and not want to go forward with my life um, because there was so much negativity attached to them. And it was really for me, once I realized, like, trying to find validation or trying to find answers in in external circumstances was the really was the very reason actually keeping me trapped and keeping me enslaved to my external circumstances. Sure. And as long as you are a slave to your external circumstances, I mean, you can never be free because <laughs> the very definition of freedom is not being enslaved, obviously. So are you conforming to like if you if you're applying a label to yourself, you're assuming that it's sort of like the the generalized or stereotypical idea of it. So like you, you, you're always going to have to fit somewhere within that label to give yourself it. And then like, right. if you deviate out of it, you know, like, you know, if, if you give the example of autism, you know, you, you, for some reason you, you stop needing to stim cause like for myself, like I go to the gym, so I, I don't really stim a lot. And so I don't do that. And I, I tend to make like pretty decent eye contact for, for neurotypical standards, and so, so I meet all of these these right. sort of criteria that kind of don't fit with autism, and so yeah, I, I mean, I've been trying to make like quite a few reels and like posts and that kind of stuff nowadays because you know people people do have especially people outside of like the autistic community they have an idea of like certain traits that they've heard from. Yeah a family member or they've seen on TV, oh, autistic people don't do this, this, and this. So they kind of use it as like a confirmation bias. It's like, okay, yeah. they don't make eye contact. Oh, they must be autistic. Or they do. Yes. They're not They're not autistic. Yeah. I love that you just brought that up also about like I make eye contact for good neurotypical standards and um, I, I don't stim that much and kind of I, – I really like that you brought that up because it kind of breaks that stigma around like autism imposter syndrome that it, we hear yeah. a lot or read yeah. a lot about. Because for me too, like the reason why my autism went undiagnosed for over 20 years was because I seemed to be functioning perfectly fine, right? And mm-hmm. then we can bring it back into those functioning labels that are also so harmful. And for me the, – like, the, the very nature of the diagnosis is – it's you know medical diagnoses are there for things that cause dysfunction like things that cause some level of disability because yeah it's like you know for for example you know the support that you would receive from getting an, an autism diagnosis uh if you don't need that support then medical practitioners don't really see a need for it right um, it's it's more but for us you know obviously it's it's great to kind of have that that validation from like an external medical scientific thing and you know and it is it's only really at points in people's lives if they if they're not diagnosed when they're younger it's at the points where they're having a really hard time and then they go and they're like hey look there's the, I show these these this and this signs of autism 
you know so so the ignition is the actual issues that you have and that that kind of encourages people to go for it but it also encourages like the medical system to to diagnose you so like if you're not having any issues with it like you know if if you're not finding that in, in your eyes autism is is causing you any issues then you know it's it's quite hard to go for a diagnosis like right yeah and and you mentioned a key word um which i think is really important to bring up and that word is dysfunction um Mm. because i actually have a line in my upcoming memoir um that reads but livia isn't autism a label (laughs) (laughs) and and i go into that because it's like yeah of course autism is label and i do label myself as an autistic person um but again the key word here is is function or dysfunction because the the autistic label knowing that i'm autistic and being able to label certain traits or behaviors as oh these are autistic traits that are part of me and help me function and help me be better like i said they help me function they help me be my full self whereas labels such as labeling food as good or bad or unhealthy or saying Mm -hmm, i mm -hmm. am anorexic or bulimic or i am disordered or i am wrong or i am bad or i need to feel guilty for this these the kind of restrictive labels rather than right they do not help us function they they Mm -hmm. cause dysfunction right that's why it's called a disorder and that's why I, i hate the terminology of autism spectrum disorder because i'm like it is not a disorder (laughs) but but again there we go with the labels right and i think it's really important when it comes to labels and if you do find yourself labeling things like i don't think there's anything inherently wrong with labeling again because labeling labeling as wrong would just be another label (laughs) but it's really about looking at what is the intention behind this is this serving a purpose is this actually helping me function or is this mm-hmm, mm-hmm. limiting me or restricting me from living to my full potential? Because in the end, I think that's all what we're here to do is to find people and discover ourselves so that we can live to our full potential. Um, and I think part of that is is looking at which labels help me do that, but which labels are keeping me from doing that. Mm-hmm. And and yeah. so like 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 a part of a part of your like your your business because obviously you're. I imagine you're a sole trader, like, so I'm kind of going through the the process of setting up a business to, and stuff. Mm-hmm. What kind of like services and stuff do you offer to people? And like, how does that tie in with the, the content that you put out? Yeah, so I am, I, I guess I would call myself a, a food freedom coach, but it honestly goes so much beyond food freedom because I think freedom in itself if you are a free person, like food freedom is inherently part of that. And I actually have started doing some like life and business coaching with other people that nice, also nice. want to, um, that are also autistic and also want to coach other people with mm-hmm. their issues. I mean, I currently have a client that has mast, mast cell activation syndrome and mm-hmm. is autistic and is in the LGBTQ community and had an eating disorder. So we're really looking at like, how can you what niche are you trying to get into so that you can really find the audience that you're looking to work with? But anyways, what I do is, is really I work one-on-one with clients to to help them discover like what are the obstacles, what are the labels in your life that are holding you back? And a lot of it is, of course, tied to, tied to eating disorders because mm-hmm. there's this huge, very misunderstood gap, link, whatever you want to call it, which is autism or neurodiversity and eating disorders. And for me personally, I believe that my eating disorder, my anorexia was simply a manifestation of underlying and undiagnosed autism. And the more and more I've been talking about this and sharing my personal story, Mm -hmm. I've been learning how incredibly common this is and that people are just not being seen or validated or understood and their eating disorder is is being treated just in a really harmful way because there was no awareness or understanding Mm -hmm. for the root cause, which is often the invalidated autism. Yeah, because yeah. like, I imagine like if you if you diagnosed with any any like you, you hear it a lot with with um, autistic women and girls getting diagnosed with like BPD or schizophrenia mm-hmm. instead of autism. It's like if you, if you already have something that like a medical professional has given you and you like you trust that 
that that sort of process all mm-hmm. of your like lines of sight is, is going to be on that and like if you can fix that everything's going to be good right you know like for for you know for a long time i could say that you know i was very sort of self-conscious and you know lacking a lot of self-esteem or self-care i would say um so a lot of the stuff that i did was you know it's kind of on the lines of yourself i was i was focusing on my external world i was focusing on i need to be the best taekwondo fighter i need to be the best scientist and so i i just focused on those two things and all, all the time i was ignoring this massive part of myself which was being autistic and right. you know perhaps if i'd learned about autism in the, in the detail that i did like during my 20s then then i did with my teens then maybe i probably uh, you know i probably would have raise my confidence more than any like medals or degrees could give me so it's kind of like it's it's interesting when you when you have something to focus on it's kind of like you find different coping mechanisms to deal with to deal with the consequences of something rather than like going and just like understanding parts of yourself and like trying to like build yourself up like from the from the inside out rather Right. Yeah, yeah. And I like that you just said that about building yourself from the inside out, because that's really the core of the work I do with clients is really looking at who are you as a person? What do you want your life to look like? And how can we actually um, embrace your your unique strength and your artistic traits to find that freedom, whether that means recovering from an eating disorder, finding financial freedom, really any kind of freedom. Because for me personally, going in and out of eating disorder treatment for over seven years, it was always, they were always trying to rid me of my autistic traits, labeling these as eating really? disorder behaviors. because really? they, Yeah, because they didn't know, because a lot of autistic traits, I mean, if you mix them with food and exercise, it, mm-hmm. it becomes an eating disorder behavior, right? Like the calorie counting, for example, it is my the underlying trait is my autistic need for attaching numbers to things, right? <laughs> Yeah. Or like the needing to eat the same foods every day, eating disorder behavior. Well, no, Safe like foods. that's an, <laughs> yes, exactly. Or like really strong sensory preferences. I if I eat something that's meant to be served hot, um, like I can only consume it if it's really hot. But I remember in treatment, like when I would want to microwave my food, it was like that's an eating disorder behavior, right? And basically by telling me that I could only fully recover from my eating disorder if I got rid of all these traits, all these preferences. Mm -hmm. I mean, recovery at one point, I was like, this is actually impossible. And it was (laughs) with that approach because I can't get rid of my autism. Like I, that is me. I am autistic. So, and, and that was really for me when I discovered that I'm autistic, it was like, I always like to compare it to recovery from my eating disorder I was just like baking this cake the whole time and the autism diagnosis was like the cherry on top of the cake like (laughs) the cake is done like because now I was like now I can actually really realize and fully Mm -hmm. embrace that I am fully recovered and fully recovered from an eating disorder for me for an autistic person does and will look really different for someone that is neurotypical right because for someone who's neurotypical maybe being really spontaneous and being able to say yes to a last minute dinner date or party or whatever, maybe that is what full recovery looks like for them. But for most autistic people, I can tell you that is not the case. So I'm sure you can imagine the harm that it, that can be inflicted upon an autistic mm-hmm. person. If some professional is saying you will only be fully recovered once this, even mm-hmm. though that's something that may never even be part of your life because of the underlying you, you, you autism. You may not, not even want it as well. Right, like, exactly. You know, a lot of the things that we advocate for, you know, especially in the autistic community, are things that parents and professionals want us to, yeah. to get rid of and not necessarily something that dramatically has a negative impact on our life. Like, right. Yeah, like <laughs> and that. It's, term- it's, it's the funny thing as well. Like, it's definitely because they're, they're, they're like labeling parts of – your autistic traits as as eating disordered related things mm-hmm. like that yeah i i can't imagine how like just counterintuitive that that must be like to go through that whole process and just well absolutely awful 
Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but I, I, I guess I mean I I turned the mess into my message now, <laughs> yeah. and that's my favorite quote ever, and that's actually also the last sentence of of my memoir book, um, because I I truly believe now looking back there were many many years where I was. I've wasted my entire youth. I've wasted everything due to my eating disorder. My eating disorder mm-hmm. stole this mm-hmm. away from me. Um, but now I can, with a full heart, full heart on Valentine's Day, <laughs> say <laughs> that I think m- developing my eating disorder was the greatest gift that mm-hmm. I could have ever received in this mm-hmm. life. Um, because were it not for that journey of self discovery I had to go through to to recover, maybe I still wouldn't even know that I'm autistic, right? Mm-hmm. Like. Mm-hmm. Who knows? Like we, of course, can never go back. But um, Let's, that that journey to freedom made me question myself and my identity, and it's what prompted me to read more about me and my traits and my preferences. And and yeah, like I said, discover I'm autistic. And now being able to bridge that gap between eating disorders and and autism, a gap that I'm learning is so so important and such yeah. a strong link that's so common. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to do any other work in the world because it lights me up more than anything helping helping others find their own freedom um, with similar stories. It's beautiful. Thank you for that, Liv. I, gu- I guess one of the the, the key things, if we kind of focus in on like the topic of the podcast, which you know, autism and eating disorders. Yeah. What aspects of autism, like or autistic traits? could impact the development of like an eating disorder what are like the the crossovers that that really stand out to you yeah so the first one that comes to mind for me is interoceptive awareness and mm. i mean i'm sure you've talked about interoception on the podcast before um but in short I don't in- th- you know what i i i don't know if i have <laughs> I, I i don't think i've even made a podcast about alexa fine yet. i really need to like oh really do something related on that maybe maybe i have maybe it's, but yeah, there's been the, a few episodes. Because <laughs> I'm sure you've mentioned it like a, a couple I, times. I probably mentioned it. It probably wasn't like one of the topics or right. anything. But. but anyways, yeah, for, for the listeners that maybe don't know, interoception in short is the sense through which we monitor the inner state of our body. So whether we know um, whether we're hungry or thirsty or too hot or too cold or um, whether we need to go to the bathroom or not, like that's all regulated by our interoceptive awareness. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But autistic individuals, as well as those with eating disorders, often str- often tend to lack interoceptive awareness. So yeah. we may not be able to recognize a physical hunger as easily, or we also may be unable to recognize when we're full or when we're satisfied, um, which can, of course, make eating and, and nourishing yourself really, really difficult. So, Definitely, like, like, even with stuff like hydration and going, like... yeah. Going, going to the bathroom, you know, like there's been many times looking back in my life where I've just got into this, this crazy, like hyper fixation rabbit hole of just like working from morning to like early hours in the morning. And I just, I start working and I'm like, oh my God, my stomach is like <laughs> absolutely churning and like making all these noises. And right. I haven't been to the bathroom much today either. And I've been drinking like loads and loads of water. <laughs> I'm just like... <laughs> How did I not realize? Right. Yeah. Well, well, I think that for me, for an example, like during during eating disorder treatment, I was like, I, I'm never hungry. Like I did not feel physical hunger. And they, they t- they'd accuse me of lying, right? They'd be like, that's your eating disorder talking. Yeah. But I'm like. Psycho, mm-hmm. Psychosomatic. Um, right. And I'm like, and I'm like, that is so harmful now that I think like you were telling me I was lying to a little 15 year old girl that was just telling the truth. (laughs) Like, I mean, it's just so, so awful. So yeah, that's like. That is medical gaslighting. Like. Totally, totally. (laughs) Yeah. So that's a big one is that lack of interoceptive awareness. And um, because, I mean, if you're unable to recognize whether you're hungry or not, like it can cause, it can lead to unconscious restriction but also on the other end of the spectrum i think it can also lead to overeating if you don't mm. can't, are unable to recognize when you are satisfied when you're full like you'll just keep eating until you feel like you're gonna burst and you're like oh maybe i ate a bit too much right so I think, i've experienced like both sides of that like when, when i was younger didn't have like hardly any hunger like i mm-hmm. i would 
I mean, I would eat enough, but I would eat like really like high calorie dense foods.、Mm -hmm. So I just wouldn't have like a lot of bulk in like what I was eating.、Right. Whereas like nowadays, starting this this medication, metazapine, which I think I've talked to you about before,、um, yeah. it's like it's it's for anxiety and depression and stuff, and it's like a sedative and it helps you sleep.、Mm -hmm. But the, one of the side effects for a lot of people is that it stimulates your appetite. And like as、yeah. soon as I, I I was on that, like my weight just like went straight up. I <laughs> I started like binging at night, and like the the only real way that I can tell that I'm full when I've had my tablets is if my stomach hurts or like, like I feel sick. Like.、Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think for me, like that was a really strong experience that I had when going through extreme hunger because when I. When I was coming out of energy deficit after years of restriction,、um, I mean, I always say like I always use New Newton's third law, which、mm. Newton I think by the way was autistic. Yeah. <laughs> But his his third law states like for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction, and I think it's the same for restriction and binging, right? Like if you've spent a long time not eating enough, malnourished, then. Like yeah, you are going to need to eat a lot of food to make up for that and almost compensate for this this buildup of energy debt that's been happening to your body. So for me too, it it literally felt like even though I didn't feel like a physical hunger, I guess like it was just this like my my bot. There was like this invisible force that was like calling me to eat and eat and eat until I literally couldn't eat a bite anymore because I felt like I was just gonna like explode. And it's also always... like relieving that mental pressure, isn't it? It's like if you go, yeah, like especially when I was competing and stuff. If you go for like days and days and days or weeks and or months or even years of like doing daily intense cardio and like yeah, eating barely nothing. It's like when you when you stop doing that, you're like, oh my god, I can eat what I want, and right, yeah, it's like you go the opposite way. You're just like right. <laughs> Because your body like has completely lost trust with you, and the only way to gain that trust back with your body is to prove to your body like there's enough food, like you're allowed yeah, to rest.、Yeah. And and of course, here a, a lot of times what ha what we see, what I see with clients is that when they come come from a history of restriction, usually anorexia, or bulimia, or orthorexia, really any kind of restriction. There's this huge fear when they're hit by this wave or like tsunami that sweeps them up. Of like, you need to keep eating. They have this huge fear, like they're、mm -hmm. gonna gain weight forever, right? They're gonna become obese. They're gonna, you know, become really, really overweight. And that's of course fueled by the fat phobia of our society, <laughs> because even this this label obese and overweight and like. It all has to do with BMI, which is is a super outdated method that is literally like not based even on even BMR is like it's 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 like not it's even based on science, like, like honestly.、Yeah. So so yeah, that's like this huge fear is like oh I'm swinging to the other side and developing binge eating disorder. And I、What? mean as I, yeah, just on the BMI thing, like I find it so funny because I I'm classified as being obese because of my BMI. It doesn't like factor in like your lean body mass or your bones your muscles, or anything. Your muscles, your bone like... structure, <laughs> like、yeah. anything. Like yeah, I mean, I I have a whole post on my website of why BMI is like bullshit, and <laughs> and I mean, if you like, it was invented by a mathematician over two hundred years ago, like、yeah. someone who didn't even study medicine, <laughs>、mm. and it was created exclusively by and for white Western European men, like. No women were part of the study. No immigrants were part of the study. No people of color were part of the study. I mean, if a neuroscientist were using two hundred year old techniques, like to do brain surgery, <laughs> he would immediately be fired.、So、how <laughs> Lobot doing lobotomies, right. right? Okay, we're gonna get you in. We're gonna take out that frontal lobe. Exactly. So, how is it that literally every health professional nowadays, with the advancement of technology, which、mm. has, by the way, never been more advanced than it is today? How is it that every health professional is still using this, like, honestly dumbass metric? <laughs> like, it just,、yeah. uh, it just it's, makes it's kinda, me so frustrated. It's kind of, it's kind of the same as like, like in a, in a similar vein, you you find stuff like somatotypes, which are very prevalent in a lot of like advertising for like fitness coaches and stuff.、Mm -hmm. You know, using like the whole ectomorph, endomorph, mesomorph,、oh, yeah. <laughs> and like it was it was actually 
designed, it wasn't designed to like give people an idea of what the metabolism's like or what kind of bone structure or body shape they have. It was actually designed to categorize people in order to see if someone's frame was related to their personality. So it's kind of okay. like, <laughs> so number one of those like pseudo things that just keep, like I was taught about it in PE, like when I was doing my, my A-level in physical education, like somatotypes, that was a part of it. And just like, why is that? Right. Yeah, I mean, so much of the education system is just so messed up. Like, <laughs> I mean, even like the whole eating disorder education. I, I, I remember like um when I was when we were learning about eating disorders when I was still really young kid in school. You know, you have the the classical stereotypical image of anorexia and and then a a a, a very thin white female that is looks like a skeleton looking in the mirror yeah, and she yeah. sees a really fat person staring back at her this is like that belief of what anorexia is mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. um something that is really that i notice a lot in, in autism and neurodiversity is that there there isn't there isn't body dysmorphia and there is not fear of waking and that was for me really personally why i never resonated with this label anorexia because i was like but i don't think i'm fat i don't want to lose weight i cannot have this illness right mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and that's why i believe the the anorexia i mean i even hesitate to call it that like the restrictive eating disorder I, is a term i prefer was was really a manifestation of the autism because for me mm -hmm. it was like all of my autistic traits like the difficulty with change the need for ritual and routine the sensory preferences, like the control factor, like the anxiety that I had around food and um, not trusting eating different foods or new foods or more foods because eating full felt really sensory and uncomfortable to me. Like, yeah, I mean that if you don't have any awareness or knowledge of, of autism or autistic traits, like, yeah, I mean, of course, anyone would label that as an eating <laughs> disorder. And then when it's invalidated and you're not believed and you're accused for mm. lying mm. and being manipulative, like it just causes you so, to cling to that control even more, which so, of course worsens the disorder. So I suppose like when you, when you were mentioning it, like it's, it's kind of like inherently assumed that if you have, you know, diagnosed anorexia, that, that, that label, that you also have body dysmorphia as yeah. well. Yeah. And you're, you're kind of saying that you, you don't need to have body dysmorphia to be anorexic. Like you can see that you're very, very, you know, skinny and you can be like, yeah. okay, right, this is not actually a problem. I don't see myself as a really fat person in the mirror. I know what I look like mm -hmm. and I don't want to be like this. And it, you, you kind of like split in the, I, su I suppose like, you know, even, even in my mind, to be honest, like, you know, to to me, you know, as someone who hasn't really sort of delved into like the the eating disorder literature and sort of the world as much as you have, like it does kind of feel like body dysmorphia and anorexia are like one in the same. Mm -hmm. But yeah. whereas you're saying that it's not, it's like oh, not at so, all. I mean, yeah. I have never had body dysmorphia. I have never considered myself a fat person. And even when I was very, very ill and literally looked like a skeleton, I knew better than anyone else that I looked like mm -hmm. a skeleton. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, of course, people were like, but then why didn't you just eat more? Why didn't you change? Well, it's because that was the autistic trait, the difficulty with change that mm -hmm. was almost overpowering this knowledge wow. of how new I how. how how sick I knew I was, right? Like the the idea of changing my ways or changing my habits was more scary to me than than being like, okay, I'll, I just look this way and I could die any day, <laughs> right? Like that's how how scary the change was for me, and and I think this is really really common in 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 eating disorders because in the end, like an eating disorder is is an addiction, just like smoking or sex addiction or alcoholism. Like the person suffering from the addiction of, often knows that what they're doing is not good for them like a, a smoker who sees their black lungs like they're not gonna they're not gonna say no like i'm not harming my body like i have no idea what you're <laughs> I talking don't have about body to right? yeah, I, right I don't have there. these lungs like <laughs> right? i'm fine like, <laughs> right exactly like they know um <laughs> they know that what they're doing is not healthy but but 
changing is is the hardest thing mm-hmm, humans mm-hmm, have to do mm-hmm. like the reason we are called creatures of habit is because we are wired to yeah. to do things over and over again because well, we're, habits, we're designed aren't we because yeah, it's like our, yes our brain's ability to form to form habits is the very thing that allows humans to survive like hmm. if we had to wake up every morning and think about how to turn on the shower how to use the bathroom like all of the energy that we would be using like on an evolutionary level to seek out food and, yeah. and survive and protect ourselves would be wasted at the it's beginning of like, the day it's kind of like bypass bypassing the need to like cognitively process everything that you're doing right like that, if, you, yes. if, if it's like a habit, like that, you just after the gym, you just go in the shower. You don't really think about it. You just jump in the shower. Like exactly. this is what I do. Whereas, right. like, you know, if you were in that sort of initial stage, like you thinking of going to the gym, you're like, okay, I'm going to go twice a week and do right. this or that. And that those like first few weeks, it's like the amount of energy and cognitive thought mm-hmm. that goes into doing that is just so intense but if, yeah. if you're in a cycle just every week you go twice a week you don't think about it and and you actually feel a bit weird if you don't go so exactly. it's like <laughs> exactly and that's what happened with with an eating disorder right and when mm-hmm. we re- mm-hmm. have repeated a certain behavior enough times it forms a habit and when we've repeated a habit enough times it forms our identity yeah and when we've been engaging with eating disorder behaviors for many, many years, we identify, we see ourselves as someone with an eating disorder and we cannot imagine our life without this illness. We believe we need this illness to survive. And that's why when that's why it is so hard to recover and to say, I, I'm choosing to to give the possibility of a different life a chance because we don't know what's going to come into place. Like for me personally, I was on the fence about recovering for so many years because I was like, what is what if what if not no longer having my eating disorder leaves this huge void leaves this huge emptiness like what's going to come in the place and yeah. there's so often right that's the the whole shallowness with that whole thing of why don't you just eat more like it's like if if it was just about food like i obviously would have long done that but it, it's so much deeper it's about the habits and the identity tied to the disorder that keeps that keeps us stuck and again that brings me back to the labels of when we remove this label of we need to identify as this type of person then we we no longer need the eating disorder because we no longer need to attach ourselves to something beyond ourselves we can just be us yeah yeah so yeah, yeah. <laughs> well um you, you know, you, you mentioned some stuff around like lit- sort of the literal thinking mm-hmm. about like the calorie count and stuff and sort of the, the sensory elements a little bit and, and, you know, aspects of like routine, which, you know, we know it's quite, it's quite an autistic thing. But what about like the anxiety? Because anxiety is a really funny one because it's not, it's a, it's a mental state, but it's also, mm-hmm. it's tied to like a very important like hormone for like, a lot of stuff because you know when when we think of like eating disorders we think of it as like a psychological thing as well mm-hmm. but there's like those there is those elements of hormones related you know like for example with cortisol the the stress hormone mm-hmm. you know that that helps us set up our like sleep sleep wake cycles yes. you know it releases before we get up and then you know and then you also with food you have um things around like uh, leptin and ghrelin and, and ghrelin, stuff like yeah, yeah. that yeah yeah so i think um um uh, what, what were we talking about the the anxiety, the anxiety i think aspect, that's directly yeah. um i think i kind of want to jump off the interception i was talking about earlier um and say that interception also affects our interpretation of emotions and a of lack fun, yeah. yeah and mm-hmm. a lack of interceptive Awareness, therefore, can lead to difficulty recognizing emotions, and this is known as alexithymia. And I believe that alexithymia is also directly ties to anxiety because people who struggle with alexithymia often may be over-responsive to inner cues of fear or worry. Hmm. And then this, of course, leads to just anxiety and distrust in the situation. And I kind of... So you can't, I, like, link... It's it's like for me it's it's I I know something's up you know I've kind of got myself to a point I can kind of tell by my bodily sensations and my mental state some degree what I'm feeling but like it's really hard for me to go hey look this this event happened then I feel like this 
like finding that connection between the mm-hmm. two is really hard. Yeah. And so like I always resort to these sort of blanket methods to overall mm-hmm. improve my mood, like exercise, like, right. you know, exercise is going to improve my mood. It's going to lower my anxiety. I'm going to get all the energy out. So I'm kind of killing all of the the birds without really addressing the cause of why I'm feeling like this. So. Right. And I think that what you just mentioned about like you know what's going to happen when you go to the gym I think this is where a really important word comes in and that word is trust Mm. because another one of my Mm -hmm. favorite quotes is the opposite of anxiety is not calm it's trust because if you think about it we only are anxious for situations when we don't trust the outcome and what is not trusting the outcome it's not knowing the outcome but when Mm -hmm. you have a habit and you've done it over and over and over again and you know that you're going to get the same every time every time you do this feel good you do this feel good you do this feel good you trust that outcome and you trust that behavior and again that ties back to why eating disorders are so addictive and people stay stuck in them for so long simply because we know exactly if we eat this or if we run for that amount of time we're going to feel like this and therefore, we we trust this whole way of living and mm. recovering from your eating disorder, choosing to do something completely opposite of what you're doing every day. That's the very definition of of bringing up anxiety because you cannot trust the outcome because you don't know the outcome. Yeah. So, and I think what you said about like eating disorders and anxiety is often seen as really psychological. I mean, there's so much research being done more and more about how anxiety and autism and eating disorders like is also a very biological, physical system yeah. too. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't want to go into a whole another rabbit hole. <laughs> We're not going to go into the HPA axis and the <laughs> yes. <yeah. laughs> but I'm reading a lot about. We're not going to go that deep. I'm reading a lot about like the Vegas nerve right now. Um, yeah, and there's yeah. Like, a it's lot of really fascinating science about how people on the autism spectrum as well as those with eating disorders like have like vagal nerve dysfunction and they're Mm. constantly in like certain systems which are keeping them in this state that their body thinks they're in danger the the vagal the vagal nerve being like pretty much the the nerve that you think about when you think about like the parasympathetic sympathetics like the the fight or the up, flight the mode. The up one, the anxiety, the the alertness, stuff right. like that is what activates you. Whereas the parasympathetics, that's the... It's also known as rest and digest mode. Rest yeah. and digest, yeah. So yeah, and just, the just clarifying nerve. around the, yes, the vagus the, nerve, yeah. The vagus nerve is also the main nerve that connects the mind and the gut. And that's, again, why if you, if you feel mentally very anxious, that's why you can struggle with digestive issues and have difficulty recognizing physical hunger because mm-hmm. your like, serotonin neurotransmitters, your receptors in your brain are literally communicating to your stomach like, you have to be anxious about something. You have to feel. Mm. And when your body perceives danger, being hungry and eating is your very last priority. Like if a tiger is going to yeah. come run all at the me. Bl- all the blood yeah, comes I don't from have time your, to be like, hmm, you've got am I and hungry? everything else to your muscles. Right. So you get and ready for action. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So, I mean, for me personally, like learning all this science and like gave me like a deeper understanding of the way my body works. And when you understand the way your body works and the way your body communicates with you, it's so much easier to nourish your body Mm -hmm. and work with your body rather than against it. Because again, like awareness, knowing, understanding how something works is the very first step to Mm -hmm. changing for the better and improving yourself. Because you can't fix a problem if you don't know what the problem is in the first place. And if I I think as well, there's, there's, you know, sort of going back to identity, I think, you know, once, once you understand something like, you know, quite often people, you know, if you go up to people and I, I talked to, to Dr. Megan Neff, uh, Neurodivergent mm-hmm. Insights on this, you know, if you, if you go up to someone and say, look, I have depression, I have, I have anxiety, they take it as like a personality trait. Mm-hmm. so it's like like just just a part of your personality right. whereas like when you understand the science it, it kind of it allows you to be a bit more detached from that label exactly. and just like okay so i'm depressed my serotonin is low obviously obviously it's not completely clear exactly how it works you know we can we can guess but you know your serotonin is low or my, my you know instead of 
You know, I, I have a condition where my serotonin is low a lot rather than I am a depressed person. Or exactly. you have anxiety. Hey, my cortisol is really firing today rather than <laughs> I'm just anxious. I'm socially anxious. I'm nervous. I have low self-esteem. Right. You know, yeah. like it, it allows you to kind of get a bit of distance from it. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, for me, the first step to recovering from my eating disorder was saying instead of I am, I am someone like with an eating disorder is I have an eating disorder, meaning I can also get rid of it. And I think you just it's like the up. opposite of autism. Like, <laughs> Exa- yeah, exactly. Well, that's funny. You just brought that up because I like my very first video I made on YouTube about autism is titled like how I found out I have autism. And one of the comments on that video was like, Hey, Olivia, I really love this video, but have you considered saying I am autistic because a majority of the neurodivergent community actually prefers... I've had those, yeah. Yeah, and, and then I sort of like... <laughs> to be honest, that sounds like a really nice comment, like, compared to, like, the sweet. stuff that I've heard at other people. It was like, it was super people plaster sweet. people on their stories, like, oh my god, this person is saying this, this, and this, and like, right, I don't yeah. agree I mean, it is it's super like... sweet, and actually it led me to, to create another video that's now on YouTube, which is, like about the identity first and the Mm -hmm, mm person-first language and um, which language you should use and kind of explaining both. And it's interesting because I created, I labeled that video, (laughs) labeled that video first as how I found out I had autism because I had conditioned my brain to to associate like the eating disorder by saying like I have an eating disorder rather than Mm -hmm. I am Mm -hmm. disordered. But with autism, it's obviously the opposite because Everything yeah. I do is autistic because I am autistic. It's not mm. something I can ever get rid of, unlike some parents of <laughs> children may think sure. nowadays. Oh, sure. Dr. Dr. Rangahan Boschenerth has cured my child of autism. Have you got those comments before in the... Uh, so many times. In- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Archive. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. Those are so, like, they just make me laugh so much. I'm just like... Oh. Jesus Christ. I get like, I've got, I think the max I've got on a post is like free before. It's just like, oh my God. Like, yeah, I mean, I, I get nobody, so many emails no too. No parents come onto this like, comment section and click on the link and go down this like pseudoscience rabbit hole. Yeah, like. or like, right. Or like even when I was like researching on Amazon, like, a like neurodivergent like recipe books to kind of get an idea of like what was out there like yeah. it was all books on like recipes to cure your child of their autistic <laughs> symptoms and i'm like this is exactly why i need such a big market right. for it in the, especially in the u.s like oh my gosh with the whole vaccine therapies. thing and stuff oh my god yes yeah. yeah and i mean yeah so this is like Again, like going back to my cookbook, like this is why a, a huge reason why I created Nourishing Neurodiversity is because I wanted there to be a book for neurodivergent individuals that like gives them permission to eat and nourish themselves in a way that allows them to embrace their neurodivergent traits rather than seeing it as like, I need to cure myself of this mm-hmm, or mm-hmm. for parents. Like, oh, if I if I cut dairy and gluten out of my kid's diet, they may stop being autistic. <laughs> Woohoo. Yeah, I'm like, when I cut gluten and dairy out of my diet, responses. all that happens is that I feel like shit. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, um, I know we talked sp- sort of generally about eating disorders, but I, th- there is something that's kind of making its rounds for the, the autistic community. There's a lot of people making posts on it, and that is um, ARFID. Yes. Like, do you, do you, like, what, what, could you, could you explain Arfid to us? Yeah. So I, I actually had an interview on my podcast that, that came out today with oh, um, nice. Arfid dietitian Lauren Sharifi. Um, and she works with, with, um, people with Arfid and Arfid like traits. And, mm-hmm. um, it's actually funny you, you brought that, brought this up in the context of eating disorders because Lauren actually did a post yesterday about <clears throat> if, whether or not ARFID is actually an eating disorder or whether it is actually just a form of neurodivergence. Uh, pref- and- or or- maybe a preference like exactly because for anyone who's listening and doesn't know what ARFID is or never heard of it ARFID stands for avoidant restrictive food intake disorder and and the reason why this can be problematic is because um people who have a very restrictive and limited diet mm. like chicken this nuggets can- chips this can result in like nutritional deficiencies, like mm-hmm. lack of mm-hmm. eating enough food. Um, but there are a lot of also like sensory, I guess, parts of traits of ARFID. Yeah, like the crunchy, people... getting crunchy foods. Or yeah, like... but also like physically, like people who with ARFID often feel 
like very full very quickly mm-hmm. and this can just lead to like under eating and not getting enough nutrition in. and in a lot of people children with ARFID um like there are growth delays and just like hormonal problems really so, yeah so I guess that's why it is considered a disorder again kind of going to what we mm. talked about them in the beginning like how this label causes like dysfunction like yeah. dysfunction disorder of proper living and proper growth but there are a lot of misconceptions about all of it and in saying that it's like just picky eating right which we've yeah. seen a lot of autistic people as well but yeah, I, I mean, I, I recommend if anyone is listening to this and they've never heard of Arfid before to actually listen to that podcast episode um, in which I interview Lauren from Arfid.dietitian because um, we really unpack like what is Arfid, what um, is the like the overlap with autism, but also like what's the difference between Arfid and like other eating disorders like anorexia, for example. Link but, in the description. Yes. Uh, live label free, uh, link tree. <laughs> yes, and... <laughs> And also with with Arfid, like it tends to be often really rooted in trauma. Um, so, for example, if a, if a child like had a certain traumatic experience, mm. um, eating a certain food and they like choked on it, for example, they they might have this fear around eating food in the future that that same thing will happen again, that they'll choke yeah. again. Um, but there's often also stories of of children being forced fed, you know, food they didn't want to eat, which causes again that distrust in eating food because maybe the association with eating food is like i'm mm. forced to eat this i have to do this but yeah, when us just... humans have to do something when we're forced to do something we will push back and we will not want to do that thing mm. yeah and then again like i said sensory preferences like really specific food textures not wanting to feel full not wanting clothes to feel too tight that was a huge one for me in my own eating disorder recovery i mean i i didn't have ofid but um, that that's one, and I think another big um, uh, trait symptom of Arfid is that people with Arfid often find a lot of food to be disgusting, or it brings up feelings of disgust. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this disgust is actually a primal emotion regulated by the insula, which is the same part of the brain that is responsible Start for uh, interoceptive awareness. So it all comes like it's all connected. Um, and I think it's so, so important for people when it comes to raising awareness of eating disorders in autistic people and making education more accessible for these people is I think is to really amplify the voices of people with lived experience and allowing yeah. them to yeah. share their story and allowing them to share what worked for them and what did not work for them like like we're doing today, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think that's that whole problem with these big ableist organizations, right? Like Autism Speaks is like, we are advocating for autism, uh, but people that have no understanding or lived Advocating for their idea of what would help Right, autistic of being people. autistic. Like, and the same with like professionals. Like when I talk, see professionals talking about eating disorders and autism or this and that, like they don't even, I'm sorry, but like they don't even know what they're talking about because they don't have lived experience with either. Like that's just the truth. <laughs> no, I, I, th- I think, you know, th- I think to some degree people, you know, professionals and people, now obviously there is quite a lot of utility in like understanding like the medical literature around certain things. But I, I do also find that the people who are, who are the best at, at doing that job mm-hmm. also have a, a, another feed in from lived experience people are like yeah. an ally like they, they they may have this the, these qualifications and stuff but they also they have an input they they, they know someone they've they've understood someone's experiences yeah. and so I, I i wouldn't i wouldn't kind of say that i'm not saying that you're saying it but i wouldn't say that every single professional is you know like didn't know what they're talking about I oh of course think, yeah but, I think I think I I definitely agree with you. Like, even like I've heard diagnosticians pretty much just palm people off because they made like a slight bit of eye contact during an assessment. Oh my god! Like stuff like that, yeah. you know. Like it's it's pe- people's biases that really I I found get in the way because they they think they know better. Like they yeah. know better than these criteria. And so, like exactly. in my professional opinion, even though I don't there's no reason for me to have this professional opinion i just think this mm-hmm. this is why you can't have that or this is why right. you have this or like i think those those types of people those kind of but 
yeah. I wouldn't say self righteous, but just kind of know it, know it all kind of people. They yeah. they definitely yeah. cause a lot of issues. Yeah, and I mean, like like what you said with professionals, like I definitely think there are some amazing professionals out there, and I think the amazing professionals are the ones that have a very open mind, mm. and they're definitely. willing and o- open to learn from their clients, and and they're constantly, you know saying i'm i'm constantly learning and and not pretending to already know everything because i think the professionals that say this is what i studied and these are my nice diplomas lined uh, (laughs) up behind me on the wall behind my desk this is why you should listen to me right these are the professionals that are very this is the one size fits all this is how we do it like if you fall without of with if you fall out of my like experience with this yeah. illness then you're too complex then you're hopeless right that was even, for me i think even like even though we we constantly see the flaws in the system mm-hmm. like the, the this this knowledge and this you know the the research and stuff that's got us to this point it's still it's still not solving anything right. like like even it's I, I could understand if it was a system and everything worked really well. We didn't have all of these issues perhaps in the autistic community or around eating disorders. But the fact that, you know, the the sort of the the recovery rates and the sort of <clears throat> outcomes for people are not like really, really consistently good. Yeah. Kind of points to the fact that they're missing something there. Like right. then you know, there, there's still developments to be made. And I think any good professional and any good scientist knows that just going towards one study and using that as a representation of what they should do is is bad you've got a you know science is a progressive thing which means that things that we accept to be facts now or things that we know are not always things that continue in the future you know there's studies that disprove them there's you know and so when someone comes up and says some some level of lived, lived experience which goes against that or they show certain traits that it, you know, it is worth actually listening to them and like yes. trying to trying to understand it a bit more for even even just for the sake of making it more person centered and individualized is, I think it's really really important. Absolutely, yeah. and I think I think what you just mentioned about having a professional that's maybe seeing something they're not experienced with, I think Mm, what mm. will make them a really strong or or helpful person is by, by asking questions and admitting like they don't know everything because any, anyone who ever says like, I have all the answers, (laughs) like is probably the one who has the least answers because in the end, like, and this is kind of the approach I take with my clients. It's like, I, I'm not here to tell you I have the answers to your problems because in fact, I have none of the answers to your Mm -hmm. problems, Mm -hmm. but what makes a good coach or a good guide or a good professional is that they know how to ask the right questions because Mm -hmm. I believe Mm -hmm. that every individual already possesses their own answers answers within them and they need certain guidance they need to be asked the right questions to to discover those answers within themselves yeah. um and that's ultimately how they save themselves and help themselves and, and find human, freedom humans are just so complicated anyway right. like we, we we know very very little about the nature of like consciousness and like how yeah. Aubrey. we know certain bits in like the in the in the in a certain level of scope and single things but we don't know how everything connects together completely we don't know how at what point psychology is different to biology or like you know there's there's so many like gray areas especially when it comes to the human brain because it's so complicated right that and of course we can never like, we can never view or observe or study the human brain without a human brain <laughs> yeah, yeah like we can exactly. never view it Mm-hmm. objectively because we we're we're studying something from a subjective <laughs> with, with mind. A brain. we're studying a brain with a brain right and like when you, <laughs> what you just said about like like we don't even know these things like the very act of saying i know is is to be conscious is to say something from your conscious awareness so how can mm. you study the unconscious mind by being conscious like you can't <laughs> So yeah, that's that whole idea of like the more you know, the more you don't know. And honestly, the, exactly these... that is that is one of my favorite quotes ever. It's like, yeah, the more you know, the more unconfident you are that you know everything. <laughs> like, right. Because because you kind of you go down this path where you learn this and this and this, and then suddenly 
it branches out and there's loads of branches and everyone follows a certain branch and specializes in a certain area but then misses the massive bulk of everything else right. and like you can't be that it's very hard to be able to be specialized because you can't by the nature of being specialized in everything and there no, are links course. to be had between separate things like for example of autism and, and eating disorders you could be a specialist in eating disorders but add autism into the mix like, oh, it's like a whole new dimension. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And it's yeah. it's so much more nuanced than than just approaching it in sort of that like boxed off kind of version. Yeah. You know. Yeah, and, and that's why for me it was honestly so freeing to to almost come to the realization and, and give myself permission to say, like, you know, actually I really don't know anything and I'm constantly learning. And isn't that the beauty of life? Is that we keep learning every day anew and through people and through connections and through through meeting amazing people like you like i oh. <laughs> like if it weren't for autism like we wouldn't even be talking like how beautiful is that <laughs> yeah, yeah i i really i really love the fact that you you got in touch because it, it was kind of at a point like i didn't really get many i don't really get many me messages or emails i'm starting to get a few more now that i'm talking about it more but <laughs> um I didn't get a lot of messages and, and like I didn't really know if I was having much of an impact. Like I only see numbers on the screen. Like yeah. it, you know. I've stopped looking at the numbers because <laughs> they make you crazy. Yeah. yeah. I, I only look at them when I need to like understand how well an episode did and uh, right. just kinda just, just to have like a little bit of an inkling. But like or or to like, you know, find how well my podcast is doing so I can sort of help uh advertise my right. podcast right. for sponsorship stuff and 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 that brings me to to one thing that i've i'm trying to do and i hope you don't mind this little insertion into the into the it's podcast, your podcast you get to, to do to, whatever the hell you want <laughs> today's podcast is sponsored by me yes as you can see if you're on youtube if you if you're on audio you probably can't see it uh i have my neurodiverse squad uh, t-shirt on it's uh basically from this company can you hear me yeah it's basically from this company called uh born anxious which is a autism based clothing company they do like very sensory friendly fabrics and stuff and they they don't have any labels in them and no labels hey, no labels label free <laughs> oh, i need them and they're really great i always get a ton of compliments when I wear them at the gym because there's like other autistic people who go or other neurodivergent people and they're like, hey, like that t shirt is really cool. Where can I get them? I'm like, well, it's it's my t shirt, so you can you can get it if you like. Um so yeah, um if you if you go into the description, click on my link tree, there'll be some some link to to find the t shirts. And I, I get a slice of it, born anxious get a slice of it. So yeah, that's that. That's the end of that. And also, if you're listening to this uh, over on Spotify or Apple or Google, please give me a rating and a small review. Really helps me out a lot. And also with YouTube, you know, like and sub if you like it. And give me a comment down below. Give me a a blue heart if you got to this point. So with that little insertion done, I, I guess one of the last questions that I want to ask you Liv is what can what can you do what can, what can people do to raise awareness of eating disorders in autistic people and kind of make that education more accessible to the general public but also maybe maybe like I, I realize this is two questions but maybe to like the medical communities and stuff yeah well like, I think like I said before I think one of the most important things anyone can do either someone who is autistic, uh, a supporter of someone who's autistic or a medical professional, anyone who wants to learn more about it is to allow people with lived experience to share their story and actually being mm -hmm. open to listening to them and not even necessarily trying to understand because I personally believe that tr if you don't have lived experience, you will never fully understand what it's like. Sure. But I think really amplifying the voices of people with lived experience and again having that open mind of maybe the way I'm currently approaching working with my clients maybe there's another way right and I think for me personally 
When I was told when I was 15, you're too complex, you're just going to have to accept the fact that you're never going to get better. That was from a professional who, in my opinion, had a very closed mind because she sure. she believed this is the way we treat people with eating disorders and because you didn't get better within our realm of approach, like, this is why you're never going to get better. And, I, and I've, I've often, for many years, I wondered why would someone say that to, to someone, right? Because obviously you don't go into the eating disorder field if you really don't care about helping people. And for me, I, I've come to the conclusion that this is said to people because, I mean, almost all of my clients who have come to me, they've been told the exact same thing, unfortunately. Sure, sure. And, and my conclusion that I've drawn from why they've been told this is because when a professional says that to their client or to their patient and basically says, like, I'm done with you, bye, good luck, they no longer have to deal with the guilt of not have been able to help that person, right? Because they yeah, yeah. then they don't have to admit to the fact that, that maybe they missed something or, or they mm. were incapable of so helping. So it's, it's not, they're putting lets, the blame onto you rather than themselves. It lets themselves. them off the hook um, mm. because in the end, we don't we don't want to be held responsible. We don't like to have problems that we don't know how to solve so by saying it's your problem i no longer have to solve this oh yay i'm free <laughs> i don't have, really right so again like amen- i said you're not amenable to the process you know you, yes. you, you're not you're not agreeing with them that this is an eating disorder trait rather than an autistic trait right? yeah so i think that would be the main one is really having an open mind and being willing to listen to people with lived experience and also listen to them and their needs and also providing a sense of trust because again for me personally like one of the biggest reasons why I manipulated the system and didn't listen and didn't do what the professionals told me to do was because there was no sense of trust our entire relationship was built on this like hierarchical like I'm the professional you're the patient I know what's best you're the sick one right but like if that's how you're approaching the treatment like you're creating this huge tension gap and and distrust and especially for autistic people that are just waiting for people to tell you off or like say no or like correct you or like (laughs) right and especially about subjective things yeah and especially for autistic people that already have so much distrust in the world i mean that's why we're so anxious (laughs) because we don't trust the circumstances like that's why we have our routines because we don't trust of doing something else if you're going to take this approach of like this is how we do it like there's no way you can help this person um because i i masked and i lied to my therapist and i lied to my nutritionist and told them just what i thought they wanted to hear and i would start my mm-hmm. sentence mm-hmm. sentence with i'm just being honest but i this is a huge fear food of mine just so that they'd be proud of me and let me get out of treatment earlier sure, <laughs> right sure. like and i'm like now thinking back i'm like that was so so problematic like if they would have just allowed me to express my reality and actually had believed me and actually have been open to the fact that oh maybe this is actually a real thing and maybe she is really different than our neurotypical clients i think i i I think my eating disorder never would have gone as bad as it would have because i would have felt validated and i would have felt seen so you you kind of felt like you had to lie to them in order to get on their good side yeah and 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 looking back it was it was them admit that the process is not working Right. Yeah. And looking back, all that lying, all that manipulation, it was all masking, honestly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, I definitely, I definitely relate, relate quite a bit on that through my sort of experience through mental health. You know, I, I, I talked about it in the last podcast with, or the, the one before last, um, with Megan and, um, it it is really really hard to find a therapist that 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 gets you, and it's it's mm-hmm. really hard to find one that you trust. And all throughout my teenagehood, I did not trust my therapist. I, I was just all the time paranoid. What are they going to tell my mom? I know it's confidential, but you know, you know, I, I'll say to them, "Hey, look, this isn't working," and then they just kind of reword it and rejig it and give me right. the exact same thing i'm like i i don't need these 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 things in place that 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 help regulate me i i know them i can remember i know what to do right i just you know there's aspects to me that i don't understand and mm. I, I just feel depressed because i feel depressed and i feel anxious because i'm i'm anxious and right 
that that was the kind of mentality that I had with it for for quite a while. And so, you know, I, I started off being very open. I didn't feel like they took me seriously because, you mm-hmm. know, with the alexithymia and yeah. lack of indirect communication, they didn't really take it that seriously. Even though I was saying some really like heavy stuff. And so I just kind of tape it off. And because I was already in that system and I was a risk to myself, they kept me in the system. So it was just kind of like, oh, every week I've got to go there and just kind of talk to them and just Mm -hmm. listen to what they have to say and not really import much. And that's how it went for a lot of the time during during teenagehood. It wasn't a very like, you know, as as Megan would say, that like co-regulating. Like mm-hmm. I didn't really feel like they were on my level. Like they, exactly. they understood me. Yeah, like, like the the hierarchy, right? Like I'm yeah. the professional, you're the client. I know what's best. You don't mm-hmm. know anything. <laughs> like if if that's like the approach, like you're already build you you're creating a foundation built on distrust. And if you don't have trust in a relationship, in the world, in anything, you you really don't have anything. Like trust, I believe, is the basis for life, for freedom mm-hmm. of any mm-hmm. kind for positivity of any kind that's why it's it's that whole stereotype of like what you don't trust me in relationships like that's the red flag right yeah so yeah i i I thank you so much for sharing that i mean i love to you your story too because i feel like we talked about so much today and we could (laughs) talk for hours and hours but but yeah (laughs) yeah so yeah thank you very much for sort of filling us in on sort of the world of, of autism eating disorders, what kind of, you know, what the links between the two are, what your, your experiences are. I think it's been really, really useful to, to hear about. Also, you know, I, I guess, you know, for me, like the really like key thing is to, to remind me that it kind of pops into my head is the, the thing that you said about anorexia and body dysmorphia not necessarily being tied together mm-hmm. all the time. I think that was really powerful because I, I think, you know, for, for, especially for myself, like, you know, with my, with my binging disorder, I'm not in denial that I gain weight with it. Mm-hmm. And like, I kind of thought that, you know, to, to have an eating disorder that you have to, you have to have body dysmorphia. Mm-hmm. And so that's, it's really interesting that you brought that up. And if, I think there's been a lot of, lot of points through the, through the podcast that have been really, really enlightening for me. And I'm sure you know, you guys listening will will definitely take a lot away from this podcast. Yeah, I, I guess if you were to encourage people to look at maybe look a couple of links, because obviously I'll put I'll put the link tree down in the down in the description. Uh, what what would you say people should um, do? What what places can they find you and follow you on? Yeah, so you can follow me on Instagram at Live Label Free. Although now I'm pretty much only sharing like big updates in my podcast on Instagram Mm -hmm, mm because I'm spending my energy and my focus on writing more books and focusing on how I can maximize my impact in the world, which I believe is unfortunately no longer on social media with the algorithm and everything. Um, (laughs) And then my my recipe book, Nourishing Neurodiversity, is out by the time this episode airs. And you can get on the wait list for my memoir, Rainbow Girl, also on my website, there's like a drop down like book and then you can just enter your name and email and you'll be the first to know about that. And yeah, my memoir, Rainbow Girl, is really sharing like in depth my entire story, my entire experience with growing up undiagnosed autistic, developing an eating disorder, my experience with being tossed in and out of the treatment system, manipulation, like I share in that book things that I have never shared anywhere else with anyone. So I'm very, very excited for that to come out. I don't know when it will come out yet, but if you're on the wait list, you'll be the first to hear about it. And then ultimately the whole vision behind Live Label Free. And then, yeah, like if you just go to my website, livelabelfree.com, you can find more information on my coaching and I have my own podcast and my blog. Um, And I also have a course on Extreme Hunger. Um, But yeah, you can pretty much find everything on my website, livelabelfree.com. So go go check out that episode that that Liv mentioned earlier about ARFID. Yeah, yeah, that's on, you can find that via my website too. So I think that would be the easiest place rather than saying, visit all these 100,000 links, everyone. (laughs) Go to the website. Cool. 
and that that will be down in the description as the place that it usually is with the link trees and my link tree will be next to it obviously if you have enjoyed this podcast i, I i've realized that i probably inserted the like personal advert like a little bit too late <laughs> and it's, it's kind of a bit weird to mention it again but yeah the uh t-shirts and stuff down in the description uh make sure to give the podcast a rating if you have enjoyed this uh it really helps me absolutely massively even if it's just a star rating and no comments that that, that is good enough for me that would be really really helpful and my instagram is very very live at the moment if you go over to at thomas henley uk on instagram obviously i have the other social medias but you know instagram tiktok youtube tend to be the places that i do the most work on uh, where i make the most updates twitter and facebook's just kind of dwindling like dwindling out a little bit so you can go over to there I, i make daily content i do daily posts and daily reels uh, so I do a lot of stuff over on there. And also, you know, you, you'll be able to get a lot more updates on the stuff that I'm doing, my daily life. A bit more of a close thing. You can ask questions. And if you if you do want to ask questions and, and get a reply that's not like a month-long wait, uh, go over to my email. <laughs> Hi at thomashenley.co.uk. Yes, it is a new email. Sounds professional. The, yeah, yeah. And uh, the website, thomasanley.co.uk, is um I'm I'm setting up my own business at the moment. I'm kind of following a little bit in in Liv's footsteps. And, and I'm, I'm gonna coach you, I'm gonna help some... you out with that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Starting off business and coaching, uh it's gonna be one to one stuff uh for autistic adults or adults who are in relationship with an autistic person. Um, if you're in any of those categories and you want my sort of uh, coaching or consultancy around certain things, or if you just want to chat, you can go over to there. Uh, it should be live sometime in April. Might be a bit sooner when I start doing some like test trading and stuff. Uh, but once I've got all my documents and stuff sorted out, it should be up and running. And if you send an email over there anyway, I can put you on my little list and email you once it's live. Don't say so, little lists. It'll become with, a big list. The little list. Okay. So there's, there's a fair few people. Don't minimize yourself, Tom. <laughs> You're meant for bigger things. <laughs> but yeah, Liv, it's been really, really lovely to finally do the podcast and um been really great to chat about, you know, something that I feel like it's really, really important to highlight because I know I know what the statistics are like for autism and eating disorders and anxiety and mental health. So always really, really good to touch on new things in the angle of autism. So really, really appreciate that. Have you enjoyed your 40 audio experience? I have loved it. It has been a true pleasure. It is honestly always so, so wonderful speaking with you. So thank you so much for having me on the podcast, Tom. Thank you very much, Liv. And thank you all uh, for tuning in and watching. Really appreciate you coming to listen to us ramble about autism today. Uh, Link's always in the description, and I will see you in another episode of the 40 Audi podcast. See you later, guys. Bye-bye.